Tillo, what's pop? We are on Twitch. We are live. And by the time you see this, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe. Turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me, man. You see it? It's the warning screen, just in case. Read that to yourself. Read it out loud. I'll stop talking. There you go. Um, don't forget, man, twitch.com. The username's at the bottom of the screen if you do want to catch a live. <sighs> we do got merch and we got Patreon as well. Everything is down in the description below. Uh, this is UK Documentary 6. I'm not, okay. I'm not, okay. The Cullens Robbery Forensic Forensics. Catching the Killer, British Murder Documentary. That's the title. Never even heard of this channel, but... Uh, copyright disclaimer under, under Section 107, 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. UK Documentary 6. I'm going to sub up. I didn't. There we go. Uh, that's the name of the channel. Mm, let's get into it. 1994, I was a detective inspector based at Islington Division, Islington Police Station. In those days, there was no permanent major crime investigation team like the one that I subsequently went on to lead. So these murder and serious investigations were overseen by a detective superintendent who was Ooh. normally the senior investigating officer. And he or she would turn up with a sergeant. They had like an assistant who was detective sergeant. He was known affectionately as the, the bag man or bag woman because it goes back to the days when these superintendents were on call to go all over the country when Scotland Yard got called into small forces. And of course that didn't happen anymore, but the term bag man, bag lady still, still stood. Yeah, I was a, a detective constable at Tottenham CRD at the time. Uh, for me, it was a fantastic opportunity. I was fairly young in service, relatively speaking. The teams were made up of seconded officers from ver various um, divisions, and I'd come from Tottenham to join this investigation. You'd get a, uh, a call into your DCI's office. Uh, it said you're on your way down to Islington. There's been a murder. You didn't really know uh, what the case was going to be until you arrived down there. And obviously, upon arrival, it turned out it was probably the most most fascinating case of my career. The Cullings robbery is probably one of the most remarkable stories I've ever come across, quite frankly. Colin Sutton, it was very early on in his career, he hadn't done any of the headline-grabbing cases that we were now familiar with Colin having done. So he was very much making his mark still when he took on this bizarre story, which in essence unfolded with um, him receiving a phone call late at night. I was at home, um, I was asleep in bed. It was in the early hours of the Tuesday morning after the Easter Monday. And the night duty DC at Islington was a, a, a man called Tony Brown, who had quite a distinctive voice. He came from, from the Midlands, I think. And uh, the phone rang and he uttered the immortal words, we've got a bit of a strange one, Governor. He outlined a rather difficult to understand set of circumstances. And the upshot seemed to be that there were two men in custody at Islington Police Station who had been arrested for committing an armed robbery and two attempted murders. Hey. That we had two men who had been shot at close range in the back of the neck inside a stolen car. And that they <gasps> thought it was a falling out between an armed robbery gang, but nobody was really sure of the circumstances. And then there was something about the alarm going off at Marks and Spencer's nearby as well. And, and it just all seemed really confusing. And I'd got used to waking up and kind of instantly snapping into consciousness and, and work mode when, when this happened. But this was one of those where I just didn't understand what was being said to me. I couldn't work out what had actually happened. In the first stages of any major crime investigation, there's a, a fog in which you're unclear of ex exactly what the details are. And certainly in this case, 
Initially, in those first few hours and days, it was unclear as to what we were actually dealing with. Colin Sutton received this phone call late at night and he said, well, just, just a second, let me just go and make a coffee. Shout out Jordan for the honey bits too. Coffee and I'll give you a call back, which is advice he'd been given on early on in his career. So I said to Tony, look, do you know what I'm going to do? I said, just, I'll give you a call back in five minutes. I'm going to make myself a cup of coffee, make sure I'm properly awake and I'll ring you back with a pen and paper and I'll see if I can understand what's going on. So I did that and five minutes later when I phoned him back, he gave me exactly the same story. And although I was absolutely awake and, and full of caffeine, I still couldn't make head nor tail of what had gone on and nor could he. And that was what was strange about the circumstances. It didn't sit right that a gang of robbers there just after they'd done an armed robbery at a, a, a convenience shop, Cullens were a sort of a, an upmarket convenience store at the time, chained throughout London. And then I found out that the Marks and Spencer aspect was that about 40 yards or maybe even less from the shop that had been robbed, there was a Marks and Spencer store where the burglar alarm had gone off. And that had gone off because there was actually somebody else burgling that shop at the same time. And it was the van, the officers responding to that burglar alarm, that had caught the robbers looking into the bag that they'd stolen. They'd run off in different directions, and the officers had managed to catch two of them, and they were the two that had been arrested. So it was a real sort of mess, because, you know, the, there's the old saying, detectives don't like coincidences. So the, the idea that, that all this was a coincidence, and there just happened to be sort of even two teams, one doing a burglary and one bigger team doing an armed robbery, within 40 yards of each other at the same time was something we didn't like and we thought there must be a connection between it. I said, look, I'll come in and it's now sort of 2 a.m. or whatever. We won't call many of the other officers in yet. We'll keep them fresh for the morning, but let's try and work out a plan between us and see if we can get just some sort of idea as to what might have gone on. What this we is, knew was that the two... This is a kind of complex type joint. You gotta pay attention. Two men fully been shot in a metro... I can't look at Rover this. metro car... Chat. ...that had been stolen earlier in the day from Clayton in East London. One of the men who was shot came from that area and the other one was a local Islington lad and their names were Colin Meek and Gary Mullins. As it transpired, it turned out they'd probably committed quite a few armed robberies having escalated through a sort of criminal career as, as they'd got older, from petty crime through to the armed robbery that, you know, ultimately was... ..was to lead to Collins. They'd both been arrested on a number of occasions, got previous convictions ranging from minor criminality when they were juveniles into their adult life. They were kind of low-grade local criminals, you know, that something... To be involved in something like an armed robbery with firearms was a little bit out of their league. It was a sort of step up for them from what they were used to doing. And, you know, somebody joked that that's pretty obvious, the fact they used a Metro as their getaway car. You know, it wasn't really the, the, the sort of powerful car of choice for, for coming away from armed robberies. They look like two idiots. As we had it after a couple of hours, it seemed to be that the two men in hospital had been accompanied by another two or three men that they had gone into the... Ain't that the same car they had in Inbetweeners? ...the Cullen store, armed with a firearm and a CS gas spray, and committed the robbery, clean, cleaned the till out. Mika Mullins went in. The, the staff were threatened at gunpoint. Uh, they were CS gassed. Some of the members of the staff were tied up using plastic cuffs, and the manager was forced to open the safe, and the proceeds were stolen, put into a carrier bag. And Mika Mullins then made their escape with about eight and a half thousand pounds to a stolen mini metro that they'd left around the corner in Liverpool Road. They'd then run back into the side street where the metro was parked, got into the metro, at which point somebody, and we assumed from the rest of the gang, had smashed the windows at the rear sides of the metro and shot them both while they sat in the front seats. Was it one gang that had had a fallout and a betrayal? Or were there, in fact, the, the two gangs? It's only when you start to unpick those details. It doesn't make sense. Catch an M for eight bands? No. 
I was looking to the background of the individuals concerned. You'd get a true grasp of exactly what you were dealing with, and it became pretty evident after the first week or so that this was freakish in the way it played out. It's going to be a major investigation. We're going to have to get the SIO to come in and, and, and form a proper murder squad in the way that it was done in those days. We didn't know whether or not they were likely to live. They were both still alive, but they had both been shot at close range in the back of the neck, so the potential for life-threatening injury was pretty sort of huge, really. So, so we were treating it from the very start as if they were likely to die. And to be honest, even if they didn't, clearly shooting somebody in the back of the neck is an attempt on their life. It's got to be an attempted murder, even if they don't die. Colin Meek and Gary Mullins were brought here to St Bartholomew's, the famous hospital, which at that time had an A&E department. And of course, we had to send officers down here because they were notionally under arrest because we, we knew that they, they'd committed a robbery. And the first thing that was rather strange that happened was that they, they underwent emergency surgery to remove these two 0.44 slugs from their neck where they'd been shot. Gary Mullins had suffered damage to... 4 that's a revolver. Okay. ...his spinal cord. The replay was ac accurate. The re... 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 um... What's the word I'm looking for? Recreation. And, ...and was quadriplegic from there afterwards. This Colin sucks. Meek, on the other hand, had also been shot in the neck, but had suffered no apparent ill effects other than the actual wound. The hospital staff took a view that I'd never encountered before. It, it was... it was... Absurd in some respects, but it was kind of understandable. The problem was the police. They were they were very keen to track where the bullets had come from, but the hospital. One of the nurses was saying, "Look, we can't give you the bullets. They belong to the patients." So one of the officers phoned Colin and said, "I don't know what's going on here, Gov. You know, the the hospital is saying they can't give us the bullets." And Colin Sutton, being Colin Sutton, said, "Oh, we can't have that." got to the hospital and said, Never you know, heard what's going on here? Spoke to a doctor and said, look, this is ridiculous. We need this to trace where the bullets have come from. While we were negotiating with the, the administrative staff at the hospital, the A&E consultant sort of almost sidled up to me with two plastic bags and said, there you go, officer, this is quite ridiculous. Have them take them. And that's how we got the bullets put into evidence. Steps were taken to try and interview Colin Meek in particular, who was less injured than Gary Mullins. Uh, Meek was initially incredibly reluctant to speak to the police and was seeking assurances that he wouldn't be prosecuted. Meek gives them a teaser and says, look, I will talk to you, but I'm not talking without a deal. He wants his get out of jail free. Right, of and course. under no circumstances will he give an interview. Colin Sutton, who is still relatively new, has to seek higher authority to get, you know, to be given, a, be granted this request. <laughs> By this time, Superintendent Harvey had arrived and I had a bit of a conversation with him and we agreed that in the circumstances, you know, our interests were best served by trying to find out what had gone on and who the missing men were and so forth. And, and this, this man who might or might not make a full recovery was, was you know, probably not the top of our priorities and, and what we need to do is to get him to talk to us. So I consulted with the Crown Prosecution Service, one of the lawyers there, and he said, yeah, that's absolutely fine, and we agreed a wording for a letter. I typed the letter up and signed it on headed notepapers. Effectively, it was a, a get-out-of-jail-free card for, for Colin Reeves with regard to this robbery. And gave it to him, and he ran it past his solicitor, and it was all OK, and he said, OK, yeah, that sounds really watertight. You can go ahead and talk to them now. And at last, we thought, and Colin Meek said, I've absolutely no idea what happened. <laughs> so Gary and I went in to do the robbery. We got back in the getaway car, and the lights went out. Said, hang on a minute, well, what about your, the other people in your team, the people who shot you, who are they? Where, where, do you, you know, how, where can we find them? How did it all come about? And said, we've no idea. There was just the two of us on the robbery. We were doing it together, but we don't know about anybody else anywhere. So then we've got the... We've got the now I broke free. Y'all did all that and set bro free. Ridiculous situation, it seems, where you've got... One pair of armed robbers going in get robbed 
of what they've just stolen by another team of armed robbers who shoot them. Yeah, th there actually were burglars in Marks and Spencer. It wasn't a faulty alarm. That, that there was a burglary there that night. So what we had was the ridiculous, quite bizarre strange, conclusion that sure. all the facts were telling us was we had one team of two men, Meeks and Mullins, who were doing an armed robbery at Cullen's. We had another team, probably, of two men who were doing a burglary at Marks and Spencer. And another team of probably four men who, for some reason, were there and were armed and had robbed the robbers of what they'd just stolen. So police became aware, having spoken to Meeks, that there was a bit of a problem now because there were two armed robbery gangs and a burglary gang operating in that small area of Islington. So the police have to then find out who the second armed robbery gang is. This was 1994 and CCTV was much less advanced than it is these days, uh, but it was so in existence. real police work. And across Liverpool Road from the Cullens branch was a pub, and they had a, a CCTV system which worked in black and white, and it worked on VHS cassette, and it was one of these where there were four cameras and the outputs went between the four different cameras for sort of two seconds at a time. Only one of those was of interest to us, that was the external one, which they used to monitor queues when, when people were queuing to get in, but that showed the street. It was the usual story, it was a VHS cassette that had been recorded over and over and over so many times that the quality had deteriorated quite badly, and everything was in about a two second jump because you, you had sort of a frame we wanted then you got three others, and then it came back to the one we wanted. So, although there was potential there to try and work out what happened, it was that was going to be a long slog, and that was going to be a difficult piece of work, uh, which a couple Still of officers were deputed to do. The CCTV cam was very. It looked like they sound like they was disappointed to actual to do actual police work important for us as the investigation went on and so from that we were able eventually to piece together from this very poor quality footage a story of exactly what happened here at the entrance to chapel market from liverpool road you can see just how compact this whole scene was because the ee shop over there was colors that's where the armed robbery took place just there we have marks and spencer and just across the road there it's the, it's the alley in which the Metro Getaway car was parked. The whole thing's like 20 or 30 yards circle. So it's just before closing, a couple of minutes before closing time at Cullen's, it was coming to the end of a long um, Easter bank holiday weekend. No doubt take-ins would have been high. So they were standing up and down the pavement there, ducking into the fire exit. What they didn't know was at the left-hand edge of the building, there was a CCTV camera, and it gave a view back up Liverpool Road, where you could see the Cullen store on your right, Chapel Market and Marks and Spencer on your left, and the alley where the Metro was parked. Meek and Mullins uh, ran into Cullen's and then proceeded to rob it at gunpoint, with the team waiting directly opposite intending, no doubt, to do exactly the same thing. It's a startling coincidence, to be perfectly honest, and one that was pretty extraordinary in my career, to have two separate teams waiting to rob the same premises on the same night. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Extraordinary. Mullins and Meek then run off, get back into their Metro to drive... Mullins and Meek run off, get back into the Metro to drive off, but the team waiting across the street... Hmm, now let's just go hit a lick. Hitting a lick is robbing robbers, drug dealers, known criminals, because there's no repercussions. That's why we call it hitting a lick. But in this case, is it, is it still considered that? No, I don't think so. Drive away, and the other gang make the instant decision, we're going to go across the road and rob the robbers. And that's what they do, shooting Meek and Mullins, both of them, in the back of the neck. They then run across with their holder, which they've put the carrier bag of money into, into Chapel Market. They're looking into the bag to see what it is they've stolen. When the police van comes along here and turns left, answering the alarm call to Marks and Spencer. That's... So a police vehicle turning up in response to the alarm was to suddenly come across 
the extraordinary scene of two armed robbery teams, two men shot in the back of the head in a stolen metro, and a team running off with a cash bag, themselves carrying firearms. The robbers see the police van and they scatter, and they run off four of them in different directions, and the police officers, they didn't know they were chasing armed men who just left two men shot and left them for dead. And they chase them bravely, arrest two, and recover the bag of money. And they did incredibly well. And not, not before one of them had thrown the firearm used to shoot Mika Mullins over a, um, a wall into a back of a beer garden of a local pub. But they were both apprehended. I, I doubt they had any true idea of what they'd fallen into at that time. They, they, they probably realised that their instincts as a police officer would have told them something wasn't right. They could have been chasing the burglars from MS. They'd obviously come across this crazy scene uh, and they gave chase. They may or may not have known that. It honestly don't even sound real. It sound like something out of a movie scene. They had firearms, but I take my hat off to them because they were both incredibly brave in giving pursuit um, in, in having come across that scene. The weapon that was thrown into the back of the beer garden was found subsequently, actually, 24, 36 hours later, it was found by the publican who called it into the police. That, that turned out to be probably a First World War I uh, weapon. Um, and because of its age and condition, I think probably they lost a lot no of the surprise. power and velocity of the, the bullets. And it was a particularly unusual piece of equipment, this gun. It was a, a First World War British naval officer's revolver, and it took a... Bro had a... Uh, what a what's a, this, this gun come apart in three parts? One, two, three, four. I'm pretty sure the trigger come out of there, too. That's tough. You got a pew pew. Rather unusual size of ammunition. I think it was 0.44 or something like that. And the ammunition that goes with it was almost obsolete, but it did have a particular signature in terms of the chemicals that were used in it. it very heavy in, uh, I think it was antimony in, in the mixture of the propellant. And so the firearms residues that were left on these two men that had been shot were quite distinctive and the experts were able to match that up with the gun that we'd found and say yes that's that's almost certainly the sort of ammunition that was used to shoot them perhaps the ammunition itself was had been weakened and that that probably explains why both meek and mullins initially survived their injuries as devastatingly bad as they they were we had two people in the cells and we needed to really to work on them to find out who they were and who their connections were um, what was likely to to lead us to the two men that had escaped. Got these two men in custody, Clifford Wilson and Joseph Brown. And they are both obviously and provably from Northern Ireland. Obviously they were likely to know what had gone on. Um, and it was the usual story with them that we spoke to them and they you know, commented everything. They should. Some checks with Special Branch and find out that they're both known as being on the fringes of Protestant terror groups over there. Very little was probably known actually about their uh, movement, certainly to the uh, sort of Met Police at that time. Um, I mean, it transpired that following the Collins investigation that they probably were committing crimes in the London area and some or part of those proceeds were um, being channeled back to Northern Ireland to support loyalist paramilitary operation. Where's Brendy? Is Brendy still in the chat? We didn't even know that this was going this way. And when I say on the fringes, the, the steer we were given was that they were the sort of people who would commit crime, quite serious crime, and make a donation out of the proceeds, or maybe do a, uh, a country house burglary and steal a shotgun and give it to the terrorists. You know, they, they weren't hardened, proper terrorists. They were criminals who had terrorist sympathies with, with Protestant terrorism in, in, in the north of Ireland. Which kind of made us think, you know, is it less likely they're gonna be too fussed and too bothered about what we do? Are, you know, are they, they're so hardened and so sort of anti-police um, and anti-interrogation that it's not going to be <coughs> worthwhile. 
were aware that Colin and um, the SIO Doug Harvey would have been speaking to Special Branch. But for the, for the majority of us, we, we were focused on the day-to-day -day activity of evidence gathering, speaking to witnesses, um, getting CCTV, and doing the day-to-day -day legwork of an investigation. It was a long slog of an investigation, to be honest. I mean, benefited from the fact that Wilson and Brown had been arrested on the night. That's obviously a major early advancement in terms of uh, what surprised. we were an investigation team, and give you gave us the opportunity to look at their associates uh, and other similar robberies. Inquiries were made into their background and their associates, and combining that with many hours of trawling through CCTV no, seized from around the Islington area that night led to the identification of Samuel McLean. The man that was adrift, or, or one of the men that was adrift still, was somebody called Samuel McLean. And, and Samuel McLean was known to be an associate with them and lived in London, but he lived in South London, some way away from you know our normal patch. McLean had fled down the escalators into the Angel Tube station, and some pretty good quality colour CCTV had captured his image as he went down the escalator. And being of a fairly distinctive appearance, a fairly gaunt man with a long ponytail, the investigation team were able to identify him as being the third party, the escaping party from the Islington. He looked like a groundskeeper. You know what I'm saying? Y'all ever seen Willie, Willie from The Simpsons? He looked like a Willie. In robbery. And all we really had was the fact that we had them in possession of the bag of money, which had provably come from Cullens. And they'd put that inside another hold all, and, and usefully in that, there was a part of a gun. But it wasn't a part of any gun that we had uh, concerned in this offence. It was, a, it was a, a piece from what looked like a piece from a shotgun. So that also was submitted to the firearms uh, experts at the laboratory to have a look at and to see if they could make anything of that which would be helpful to us. We identified that Cullens in Notting Hill had been robbed in a very similar fashion to using weaponry similar to that which the Northern Irishman in this case in Islington had been holding and it became pretty apparent that <coughs> actually the same Northern Irish gang had robbed Cullens. The partial firearm, the piece of gun that we found in the hold all went to the lab and not only did they find a fingerprint on there from a man called Kenneth McMillan who was another associate of, of these uh, Irishmen and, and indeed was from, from Northern Ireland himself but it also showed us that that piece of gun had come from a firearm, a shotgun, which had been recovered at an armed robbery in February 1994 in West London. So one of the key elements of linking the previous robbery at Cullens in Notting Hill to the Cullens robbery on that night at Islington was uh, the forensic... Do they know how forensics work in the UK, like with firearms? Oh, got me doing crimes with the same pistol. The same, same gun and firing it and getting rid of it, pieces of it over and over again, like they're not going to link any of it. Zig link made between the stock of a shotgun that had fallen off during the robbery in Notting Hill. Upon the forensic examination of the weapons recovered that had been dumped as the suspects fled from Islington, the scientists were able to prove that the stock of the gun found at Notting Hill was actually a mechanical fit forensically and an exact match to that found at Islington. So they could effectively say the same gun proposed to be used at Islington by the Northern Irishman had been used to rob Cullins in Notting Hill two weeks earlier. The discovery of the link between the robbery at Notting Hill and the robbery of the Cullens in Islington led to the uh, investigation team taking over that uh, inquiry in Notting Hill and ultimately led to the identification of a fourth robber for the Notting Hill robbery. We enlisted the local surveillance team in North London uh, to support us and to go down to South London, perform surveillance on uh, Samuel McLean for a day to see if he could lead us first to where exactly where he was living, but more importantly to anybody else he was associated with. The type of surveillance undertaken on Samuel McLean was what's called directed surveillance, so it's covert, done by a number of officers using a small surveillance team and to follow his movements as he moved around South London. Ultimately, it was not to lead to his identification as sort of further offence. 
ultimately a small surveillance team and to follow his movements as he moved around South London. Ultimately, it was not to lead to his identification of sort of further offences, but it was uh, helpful in building up an intelligence picture. And so we went down to, uh, to Broccoli. It was the first time I'd been to that part of the world, really, uh, to an old police station there. And we had an early morning briefing and, and I briefed the surveillance team and I knew some of them from other jobs I'd done. And one of them, in fact, was just from a childhood friend of mine. And uh, briefed them, sent them out, waited, went back to Islington, waited for whatever they were to find to come back. And uh, the news that I got was that they, by all accounts and popular consent, it was the worst day of mobile surveillance they'd ever done in their lives, ever. <laughs> and I sort of said, well, yeah, what, what, what was the problem? The surveillance was problematic in terms of McLean. I mean, it's resource intensive, uh, but McLean's job actually was as a minicab driver. And as a consequence, it meant the surveillance team were dragged about from journey to journey as McLean drove from bingo halls to supermarkets in the South London area. Um, and ultimately, it was a frustrating exercise, no doubt, for all of those involved. We then put some static so surveillance on his dress for a little while to, to see who came and went, and, and there was nobody noticeable, nobody that was obviously another part of the gang. And so um, he was then arrested and, uh, and, and brought in as well. Just for nothing. Some months later down the line, a decision was taken to arrest McLean. And in a coordinated armed operation, both uh, Samuel McLean and the fourth man from the Notting Hill robbery were both arrested simultaneously. McLean, Wilson and Brown were each charged with the attempted murder of Meek and Mullins, as well as the armed robbery at Cullens. Kenneth McMillan was charged just with the West London Cullens robbery previously. And there started, you know, the, the normal kind of period leading up to a trial where we're trying to get the evidence in order and trying to make sure that we have the strongest possible case. By that time, obviously, Wilson and Brown had already been charged with their part of the uh, conspiracy to rob and um, the attempted murder of Meek and Mullins outside Cullens in Islington. One of the difficulties we had was trying to make best use of this rather grainy, rather sort of imprecise CCTV that we had. A couple of the... <sighs> That's the thing about using grainy and CC... Like, as far as I'm concerned, a lawyer could beat that in case. That's not me. Look at the quality of this. How could you... You know what I'm saying? You might be wasting your little time. The DCs and the team that were, were looking at it spent hours, literally sort of eight or nine hours, to try to work out what had gone on in a few minutes on the street. And it was that difficult to, to interpret these images they had. These investigations, you know, do take us. Right, if it's difficult for you, why even bring it to court and <laughs> tell a jury to look? Significant amount of time, the forensic work and the detailed CCTV analysis. There's a lot of focus in the main areas of um, trying to identify witnesses. Of, Despite there being a number of witnesses who heard shouting or running or shots, very, very few eyewitnesses you could fully rely on given a detailed account of the whole event. So it's piecing uh, what has happened that night uh, little bit by bit until you get a fairly substantial picture. Obviously, it was a very complicated scene. The, the CCTV isn't the kind of footage that we're used to seeing now. It was very grainy and it's very unclear. And we had an office meeting, one of the briefings we that we always that. have, we were all sitting down and they're talking about it. And one of the DCs had produced a comic strip on a piece of paper of stick people. He was no artist, but he'd put these stick people on there in different frames and saying, this is the best we can work out exactly what happens. They drew some stick figures to try and explain, you know, what was going on. It was very bizarre. And they sat with the team, with Colin, and he thought, well, what are we going to do here? And we looked at it, and I just made one of these throwaway comments that sometimes come, come to fruition. I just said, oh, it's, you should have drawn it on the corner of a telephone directory so we could flick it through and they'd move, like a moving picture, like, you know, you used to do when you were a child. Right, right, right. And the time, you thought she was funny in that moment. Turns out it was just a dad joke. It's not funny. And you still tickled about it. That's, okay, but anyway. And, uh, and there was a few chuckles about it. Colin was at home and he was watching. 
Bro just gloated about a joke mid, mid documentary. An advert on TV for the Channel Tunnel, which explained how it was going to work, how it was going to operate. And Colin thought, I wonder if we can get someone to translate these little stick figures into some kind of animation. And I looked at that and I thought, well, if we could only do something like that with these stick men, so let's translate these stick men into a, a slip sort of animation like that, that would enable us to present to the jury what that film was showing us. And that was my problem, was that the jury didn't have eight or nine hours. And if we put those grainy images up and somebody tried to explain it, they wouldn't see it straight away. And, you know, they're not used to looking at stuff like that anyway. And it would be impossible to get over to them in the time we had the importance of what was shown. Because what it showed was that there was a group of men up and down outside the park <coughs> on there with a bag so the animated stick figures held up that are waiting and then the two robbers come in and do the robbery at Cullen's and then these men go across the road and that's when it all happened and when the robbery of the robbers happened he went and discussed it with his senior officer and they thought well this could have legs let's let's take it to the CPS I kind of floated that idea past past Doug Harvey and he said yeah I can see what you mean I think he made a joke saying well uh, there'll be lots of the jury that are used to watching cartoons who'll probably go down well with them which was, was, was quite abusing so I... it's not funny <laughs> I found no humor in either joke so far contacted a firm who did that sort of thing they were down in Swindon and I went with uh, with one of the officers Tim Cawthorn to see them and took the film down and, and also had to speak to the CPS because there was no point in doing all this if we couldn't use it at call. So they explained what they wanted to the CPS and the CPS said, well, I don't see why not. Let's see if we can find, a, a, you know, an animation company. So they did. They tracked down who had made the animation for the Channel Tunnel and the CPS said, well, as long as it's, you know, they can do it and it's a faithful representation, they can get it signed off that this is what happened then absolutely, yes, we can do it and show it to the... Even though that may be what happened, they could have literally just fabricated it and got it signed off with a... With a what did, how did she phrase it? Yes, yeah, said, well, as long as it's, you know, they can do it and it's a faithful representation. As a faithful representation. Do you see how the court system works? It's just insane. Yes, we can do it and show it to the jury. And that's exactly what happened. Commercial private firms like that. If you ever have court and they come in with animations, you're cooked. They want you gone. <laughs> See that there's a potential opportunity to assist police in doing this in the future. And they even did it for us for nothing and said, you know, we'll do this as a trial to see if, see if it works. So it didn't even cost us anything. And we were allowed to use it. And I'm sure that was a very persuasive piece of evidence for that jury was that they were able to, that's crazy. to sit and watch with absolute clarity what the CCTV had recorded. And it's a perfect example of how Colin Sutton thinks outside the box. The trial of the Northern Irishman at the Old Bailey was an extraordinary event, to be perfectly honest. They were some of the biggest hitters in the British judicial system were involved in that trial. Representing the Crown was Michael Worsley QC, who was the most senior Treasury counsel at the time, and representing the defendants included Michael Mansfield QC and William Clegg QC, two of the most eminent defence counsel in the country. The trial drew an awful lot of attention, both from the media and also members of the public. All four men stood trial at the Old Bailey and they all denied involvement, just said it wasn't us, we weren't there. But, of course, we had the fingerprint evidence and we also had the CCTV evidence, which, with this animation, was easily presented to the jury. What the animation showed was the four Northern Irishmen across the road from Cullens waiting to rob it and then the Metro turning up. Meek and Mullins going into Cullens, coming out with the bag after they'd robbed it, in two of the Northern Irish gang crossing the street where they shot Meek and Mullins in the car. The jurors were therefore able to see this really conclusive this animation with absolute clarity. It was a fascinating trial to be involved in, to be honest, as a young... I'm still confused about how that even worked because you can't say it's exactly this person or that person. ...detective, a number of different 
defences were put up by those representing the defendants. It ranged from the shooting being the responsibility of a rogue flying squad team that night to the fact that it couldn't have been them as they committed a burglary on a garden centre in South London that evening and were burgling that premises rather than in Islington. So the whole combination of different defences, I mean, I specifically recall having to ask the flying squad to provide a statement, prove that none of their officers were on duty armed that evening to try and negate the claim made by uh, those representing Brown that it was actually the flying squad who'd shot Meek and Mullenza and not the Northern Irishman that had been uh, arrested on the night. Samuel McClay. You know who paying for them top lawyers. Mm. In Clifford Wilson. Gagnon. With Brown, the three men that were involved at Cullen's in Islington who shot Meeks and Mullins, they got 20 years each. Damn. Kenneth McMillan was convicted only of the armed robbery at West London in February. He received 12 Damn. years. The Northern Irishman, upon conviction, was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment at the time, and in hindsight, I think that's a fair sentence, to be perfectly honest, in all the circumstances, and given their background. I ain't even gonna lie, buddy right here, he don't need no time. He's, he's, it's, he's learned his lesson, he'll never rob again. All the circumstances, and given their background. It's done. Judge Michael Coombe, QC, sentenced the men and remarked that it was obvious that they're ruthless men, utterly selfish and utterly determined to enrich yourselves, no matter who might be hurt, physically or materially. When you look at the sentences these men received, at the time, they seemed about right. Twelve, certainly Macmillan, 12 years for one armed robbery seemed about right. The other three, I suppose, were sentenced really as if they committed a murder. You know, they got 20 years. This was before the days where the aggravation of using a firearm meant, you know, these days if you murder somebody with a firearm, the starting point's around 30 years. Uh, but that wasn't uh, the case at the time, and, and the sentences were, were what we expected. Uh, and I think reflected the, the, the criminality and the ruthlessness of the men. Gary Mullins was never fit enough, considered fit enough, be able to stand trial. His, his health had already deteriorated. He was a paraplegic exactly. at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. And by the time we came to prosecute Colin Meek, uh, Mullins was in extremely uh, serious ill health. Meek, on the other hand, Colin Meek, went back to life as before. And that life as before included committing armed robberies. And uh, he was eventually arrested by the Flying Squad for a number of armed robberies in about 1997. They started to put a series of crimes to him, and one of the crimes they put to him was the armed robbery at Cullen's in Liverpool Road, Islington, in Easter 1994. I was heavily involved in the trial of Colin Meek. Um, we'd, he'd been arrested by, on our behalf by the Flying Squad um, at his home address in Stoke Newington. And he said, ah, oh, yeah, I, I did do that, but I have this letter that says that I can't be prosecuted for it. And they looked at it and decided that it probably wasn't legally valid and charged him with it anyway. Dang! Imagine admitting it showing a letter and they said it's not valid. His defence was primarily that he'd uh, been granted uh, immunity from prosecution um, to try and secure his witness evidence in relation to the trial of the Northern Irishman. Oh, that's due from the beginning? Oh, my. <coughs> got that letter and still got jammed. That's crap. That was not an argument that held sway at the old Bailey. <sighs> so almost inevitably, his I would have fought that. defense I team seized upon this and, and spoke to the CPS. And uh, there was a, a degree of, of misremembering or amnesia at the CPS because they kind of didn't recall having a conversation with Doug Harvey and myself about the letter anyway. And I was summoned to go to the Old Bailey to Colin Meek's trial and was given a pretty sort of tough time by his team in the witness box. And, and I just obviously told the truth and told it what it was like and said, this was the position we were in. We spoke to the CPS. They told us to write the letter. We wrote the letter. He actually didn't tell us very much, but 
you know, we didn't know that. He complied with his side of the deal. It's a matter for the court to decide what should be done about it. And the decision of the court was that the letter shouldn't be a bar to prosecution. He was convicted of the Cullens robbery. You know. Cut a deal, get it signed by all the proper channels and still get jammed. Listen to this, man. Several years later, that sounds was bogus to me. For this, that, and other armed robberies. So, despite the fact that Colin Sutton was given the worst grilling in the witness box that he'd ever had in his career, the judge decided <gasps> it wasn't a bargaining situation and he was convicted of the crimes, ultimately, the Cullen's robbery. There's no doubt that. Colin Meek's sentence of 10 years actually was in part lowered to that figure because of the injuries that he'd suffered on the night. I'm pretty certain about that. That I would have expected a robbery of that level of violence and sophistication ordinarily would probably received a longer term of imprisonment than a 10 years. He decided, I think, to retire from armed robbery. But in 2005, he finally got his own 20-year prison sentence because he was convicted of a murder, a murder of a drug dealer who he shot while riding a motorbike. And it's thought that it was a contract killing. So perhaps he thought hire, that, that yeah, was an easier yeah. way to make money than doing armed robberies. It was just another way for him to get into prison. After the conclusion of all the trials, I went to see Gary Mullins at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. By that stage, Gary was a paraplegic, unable to move out of his bed, but he did speak to us quite candidly for some time. He, he was very open about uh, a life of crime that he committed. It was pretty clear um, in speaking to him that Mullins was probably regretful uh, of how that night had played out, and I think it was fairly obvious that he'd wished, actually, that he'd probably died on the night. He didn't live for very long to be... Yeah, I ain't gonna lie, man. Don't let me not be a... Don't, don't, I don't wanna... Just take me out the game, coach. To be honest, he, he ended up uh, needing all sorts of full-time care, obviously, because of his condition, and uh, he died in a... some sort of residential care facility in, in West London about two years, three years later. It was an extraordinary case to be involved in and one that I learned from a lot. Ultimately, I was to end with a 30-year career in the CID, including myself as a detective inspector on homicide and serious crime. And of all the cases, this is the most fascinating, actually, and the one that when you get asked about what's the most interesting case you've ever been involved in... Yeah, that is pretty interesting, Without for doubt, sure. the events of that April 1994 at Collins and Islington is the case that I refer back to. their work group. Oh, are we done? TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification. Very interesting. We don't need to watch this segment.